The story begins as a group of muscly men are conducting a ritual. We see a boy named Yuki being carried along and we learn that his father is the founder of this strange cult. His father tells him about the ritual where he will be submerged underwater for three days, overcoming death and becoming the new leader of their religion. Yuki begs his father to let him go, saying he will die, but his father insists it's a ritual, calling out to their god Matama. He tells Yuki not to worry, saying that Matama will protect him, and he gives him a necklace. Yuki is thrown off the cliff and falls into the water. As he sinks, his life flashes before his eyes, and he remembers how his life was always a struggle, because he was forced to take part in the religion. He tried to stay positive, but one thing kept happening after another, and he had a terrible fortune. Seeing all his struggles, Yuki wishes that if he is reborn, to be sent to a world without gods and religion, just wanting to have a normal life where he can make some friends. When he wakes up, we meet a girl reading a book, and she strokes a certain area, hoping to revive him. Yuki wonders what she is doing, and the girl becomes embarrassed, apologizing profusely. She introduces herself as Al, offering to serve him until he is healed, telling him he can come to eat at her restaurant for free. Yuki comes to the realization he was sent to another world, so he immediately asks Al about the whereabouts of the guild. She doesn't quite understand him, but Yuki says he is looking for the Adventurer's Guild, where he can get jobs and meet other adventurers. Al tells him to follow her, and Yuki gets excited to start his adventure in a fantasy world. But he ends up as a farmer, and he thinks it's a boring quest to start with. He gets approached by a guy named Roy, telling him to keep his hands off of Al, but he is interrupted by Clan, who tells him not to cause trouble. They introduce themselves, and Clan says he has a job for Yuki. He hands him a dagger, and Yuki thinks it's his starter weapon. He wonders if he will be sent to fight some goblins, but he ends up being tasked with harvesting grapes. Clan thanks him for his help, but Yuki thinks he is being tested with boring quests at the beginning, so he gives it his all and harvests as much as he can. However, it turns out he harvested too much, and Clan worries they will have to throw the excess away, since they have no way to preserve it. But Yuki ends up turning it all into wine, and Roy takes a liking to him. Alcohol is usually too expensive to buy, but Yuki managed to make it from the grapes. Everyone drinks and has a good time, but Yuki thinks about what he has done over the last month, having only farmed and made wine, which is different to how he imagined it should be like in another world. We learn that Al has a sister named Sil, and they let Yuki stay with them at the restaurant. Although this world is not what he expected, he is glad he was able to make some friends. The next day, Yuki wonders when he will get to do something otherworldly, when suddenly, one of the villagers tells everyone to run. A giant beast appears, and Yuki thinks it's a monster. Roy calls it a kaiju, and the beast turns towards them. Yuki is terrified, but Roy prepares to handle it. He takes out a book and starts waving his arm, but as Roy reads, they end up running away. They end up in a cave, and he asks what was in his book. Roy explains it was his kaiju strategy book, and it is only filled with escape strategies. We learn that magic doesn't seem to exist in this world, so his wounds are treated manually. They all drink together again, and although things aren't going the way he expected, he thinks that things aren't too bad. Yuki outdrinks Roy, and Sil declares him the winner. As he rests, Al mentions that the village has been happier ever since he arrived and she hopes that he will stay in the village forever. Yuki thinks he wouldn't mind staying, thinking things have been better than his past, so he thanks God for sending him there. But Al is unfamiliar with what God is. Yuki learns that not only is there no magic in the world, there is also no concept of God or religion. He finds a dead animal, thinking he should give it a burial, but he realizes that without a God, he wonders how the people treat the dead. He suddenly runs into Al and Roy, who wonder what he is up to, and they think he has been out hunting. Roy suddenly asks if they are friends, and he mentions a rumor he heard about a forbidden book. Yuki thinks it's finally a lead to learn more about the world, asking what it's about, but it just turns out to be a book about segs. They head to the capital, and we learn that they live in a remote village a while away. Roy points out the palace, where all the knowledge about farming and dealing with the beasts is taught to them by the emperor. Roy advises Yuki not to talk with anyone from the city, saying that their village is despised by the rest of the people. Yuki finds this strange, but Roy points out the shop they are looking for. 
they are greeted by a girl, and they come across the forbidden book. Yuki takes a look, and Roy can't handle it. Yuki thinks it's more artsy rather than dirty, but Roy thinks he is a freak, saying that type of thing is super forbidden in their country. As they leave, they come across a gathering. Yuki gets a closer look, and he sees a bunch of people drinking a vial, which causes them all to die. Yuki is devastated seeing this, and Al pulls him away. Yuki wants to know what he saw, and Al explains that their country has an end-of-life system, where the country can order people to end their lives. Yuki finds this hard to accept, and starts to get worried, but Roy says they are special, and tells him not to worry about it. As they leave, the people look at them with disgust. At night, Al sneaks into Yuki's bed. Yuki wonders what she is doing, and Al wants to practice the things she learned from the book, thinking it can give men more energy. She promises to do her best, and there is a struggle, which leads to Yuki being tied up, and Al apologizing to him. She thinks she was sent to this village because she is weird, revealing that their village is an isolation camp where all the outcasts are sent. Yuki wonders what that means, and Al shows off a branding mark that marks her as a resident of the isolation camp and as someone who fears the end of life system. Al says that he was the first person she met that didn't look at them with disgust, even sharing in their life and laughter, so she thanks him, and Yuki is also glad, because they are the first friends that he has made, so he doesn't care if they are outcasts. Al notices his necklace, calling it beautiful, and Yuki thinks about how it was the only thing he brought from the other world. He gives it to Al, thinking it's nothing special, and Al is overjoyed. He tells her it's getting late, so Al heads off, but she is glad to have met him. When Yuki gets up, he finds it's strange their restaurant isn't open. When he heads outside, he finds Roy beaten up. Roy explains that their village is a dump for everyone who is considered a deviant, and instead of being told to end their lives, they are forcibly taken. He says that it was time for Al and Sil, so they were taken, and he apologizes for not telling Yuki sooner. Clint arrives on a carriage, saying they still have a chance, and they head off to the capital. We see Al in the rain, and she looks at her sister's body. A soldier prepares to end her life, but Yuki comes rushing to save her. He fights off the soldiers, and they wonder who he is. Looking at Sil's body, Yuki wonders why things have to be like this, but a captain appears, saying it's because they are deviants who fear the end of life. Yuki wonders what's wrong with fearing death, but the captain says that life coming to an end is nothing to fear, thinking of it as their duty. Yuki is stabbed by the captain, and he falls to the ground. Al cries for him, but she is also taken out. Seeing his necklace, Yuki thinks about how his father said their god would protect them. So he calls out to his god, and his beat flies up into the sky, causing lightning to strike. The sky opens, and a being emerges, and descends down to the world. There is a huge shockwave, and the girl hugs Yuki, happy that he called upon her. She realizes he is about to die, and she turns toward the captain, unleashing her power which traps them all, and she proceeds to swallow them all up. She goes to patch Yuki up, and Al realizes she is alive. The girl clings onto Yuki, but he wonders who she is. She is devastated to hear he doesn't recognize her, so she introduces herself as his god Matama. Everyone is healed including Sil who is brought back to life, and Matama flexes her power. Yuki is surprised she can revive the dead, and all the spectators seem to just leave. The trio return to the village, and everyone is shocked they made it back alive. Roy tries to hug Sil, but she just dodges him. Everyone drinks in celebration, but Yuki starts to worry that they have pissed off the people in the capital. He wonders how he can protect the village, because they don't really stand a chance against an army, so he thinks that Matama is the only one he can rely on, but Roy interrupts him, telling him to drink. We see Matama with the two sisters. She wants to go to Yuki, but they try to get her dressed. Al wonders what her relationship is with Yuki, and Matama says she is his god. Al still has no idea what that means, and Matama explains it means they are together until death. Al becomes devastated hearing this, thinking she means they are married, and she starts thinking that Yuki is into little girls. She starts overthinking things, and Sil explains she is in love with Yuki. Matama is glad to see that Yuki has people that care about him in this world, and she asks Al to continue to be his friend, and Al instantly agrees. Back at the bar, Yuki asks Klen to tell him more about the country, 
asking to learn more about the end-of-life system, Klan explains it was a system established hundreds of years ago by the Emperor, but Matama suddenly headbutts him and interrupts. Klan asks who she is, and Yuki explains she is from the same place he came from, and they have known each other for a long time. Roy sees Matama, and he instantly falls in love, asking her to marry him, but she instantly rejects him, and he starts to lose it, while everyone finds him creepy. Yuki wonders how powerful Matama is, and she claims that she can do anything. He wonders if she could beat the army of an entire country, and she says she could just wash them away with a gush of water. Yuki gets excited, thinking about how he was reincarnated into the world without any overpowered skills, but he realizes he finally got one. Matama attempts to show off her power, but she only manages to refill a drink. Yuki wonders what happened. Matama checks her number of followers, which turns out to be zero, so she has no powers, explaining that a god's power is linked to the number of their followers. Yuki thinks she is useless, but she wonders why he isn't her follower, even though she used up her remaining power to save him. They suddenly get a message that the capital has started looking into their incident, so they start to worry that soldiers will be sent to them, but Roy tells them not to worry, because Yuki will save them again, and Yuki nervously agrees. Yuki has a bath, and he starts freaking out, not knowing what to do. Matama suddenly joins him, wondering what's on his mind. Yuki worries that the village will be attacked because of him, and Matama suggests the two of them run away. Yuki refuses to run, and Matama reminds him how he just endured things in his past life. But Yuki refuses to stand by as he did in the past, so he decides to help her gain followers and create religion in this world so that she can become a real god and use her powers. They start with Roy, and since he is in love with Matama, he instantly agrees to be her follower. Matama sees that she finally has one follower, but complains that Yuki still hasn't followed. Yuki plans to get 10,000 followers before the army arrives to attack them, and Matama says it would be enough for her to reduce them all to ashes. They think about the best way to get followers, which would be to perform miracles. But since Matama can't do that in her current condition, Yuki thinks about what his father used to do. But Matama tells him not to worry, even without her powers, she has godly wisdom from living over 10 billion years. They set up along the street, and Matama claims to know everything, giving examples about Yuki's childhood, like how he couldn't pronounce broccoli as a child, and she even knows about his secret birthmark on his ass cheek. Yuki gets embarrassed, but Al thinks it's cute. As Matama continues, Yuki says she is useless, telling her to stick with performing miracles. Yuki has no idea how to get more followers. They refuse to give up, trying to perform a magic trick, and even attempting to fly, to convince the people. It all ends in failure, and Matama thinks she is a useless god, while Yuki starts to appreciate what his father accomplished. Al suddenly comes in in a panic, because their pet fox accidentally ate some pest poison. Yuki says they need to find a vet, but Sil says they don't have one in the village. At night, Yuki returns with some herbs, which he makes into an antidote, and feeds to the fox. They start to relax, and Matama comments on how Yuki wouldn't have done this in the past, but Yuki says he wants to do what he can. The fox rejects the antidote, and starts to fade away, but Matama uses her power on it, and manages to restore its health, although it drains Matama of all her power, and she says it's all she could do with a single follower. But she suddenly gains power, as Al and Sil believe in her. Yuki is surprised she gains so much power, and he thinks that the way someone becomes a follower affects the amount of power they give. Since Al and Sil witnessed a miracle firsthand, they must be giving Matama more power. Matama starts laughing with her overwhelming power, and she decides to prove herself again. Al asks for the soldiers that they killed to be brought back, because she thinks they were just doing their job. Yuki gets worried about reviving the guard captain, but Matama proceeds to use her powers and bring all the soldiers back to life. But a woman screams, and it seems Matama accidentally brought the guard captain back as a woman. Captain Bertrand returns to the capital with a report about Yuki and the town. However, the guard doesn't recognize him, pushing him away. Bertrand tries to explain who he is, but the guard doesn't believe him, since he is now a girl. The guard thinks he must be from the isolation camp, so he sends him away. Meanwhile, 
we see a mysterious girl battling a giant beast. The girl activates her power, which instantly destroys the beast. We learn her name is Ataru, and she is working directly for the Emperor. Bertrand wonders what he should do, now that the Empire that he was so devoted to has abandoned him. He gets approached by Roy, who taunts him about getting rejected from the Empire. Roy starts to find him cute in his new form, and Bertrand can't defend himself, because he can only use his sword for the sake of the Emperor. But Roy gets thrown away, as Yuki comes to the rescue. He admires Bertrand's loyalty, but now that the Empire has abandoned him, he asks him to join him, promising to create a place where he will belong. Bertrand stays loyal to the Empire, but agrees to help Yuki, to thank him for his help. The villagers are attacked by one of the giant beasts, but a man named Ricky decides to stand his ground. Yuki arrives to help, and Matama summons her holy weapon, telling Ricky to use it to defeat the beast. Ricky attacks, but gets instantly defeated, and Yuki wonders why the sword was so useless. He regrets counting on her, and they are about to be attacked by the beast, but Bertrand saves them just in time. He tells them to get back, as he slashes the beast, defeating it with a single attack, and everyone is amazed. Yuki takes the chance to introduce Bertrand as his holy knight, and tell the villagers about their religion, saying their fields can be protected against the beasts. The villagers wonder what religion means, and Matama starts to explain she is God, but Yuki stops her, explaining that they are just a group who have a mascot that they call God. The people wonder what a mascot means, and Yuki compares Matama to Al's pet fox, saying that if they follow the religion, where they just love Matama as their mascot, they won't need to be afraid of the beasts anymore, and the people are convinced. At the restaurant, when people try to order wine, Al tells them they are now only serving wine to people in their religion, recruiting them to join, and the people happily agree to sign up. Yuki is using every way he can to gain more followers, even bribing people with cookies, which they have never tasted before. As a welcoming bonus, he even has Matama using her power to give people a massage, and in the end, Matama gained 107 followers, and her powers seem to be growing. Yuki says that since there is no concept of God or religion in this world, converting people is actually easier, because they have no aversion to religion, but he wonders just how many followers they will need to stand up to the Empire's army. We suddenly see Bertrand running for his life, as he gets chased by Al and Sil. He appears before Yuki, wearing a maid outfit, and asks Yuki to end his suffering. Yuki ends up asking him about the number of soldiers in the Empire's army, explaining that he just wants to keep the village safe. Bertrand tells him he is mistaken, because the soldiers aren't the threat he needs to worry about, explaining that the Emperor has an elite unit of Archons, which he has directly given special powers. Yuki wonders how strong they are, and Bertrand has heard rumors that they are all strong enough to destroy a mountain. Ataru prepares to head to the village, but she gets a message from another Archon named Loki, alerting her of another beast she needs to eliminate. Ataru thinks Loki is up to something, and her time is being wasted, but Loki insists that the beasts are a threat to the Empire and need to be taken out. Yuki goes to Matama, asking if she has the power to destroy a mountain, but Matama jokes that she could destroy a mountain of snacks. Yuki asks for a serious answer, and Matama says she could easily do it with only 10,000 followers. She boasts about her powers, but Yuki becomes depressed hearing this, thinking she is useless. We see Yuki approaching Bertrand, who is in another outrageous outfit, and he thinks Yuki must be after his body. But Yuki is actually just interested in his sword, but it seems ordinary to him. Bertrand wonders what he wants with his sword, but Yuki thought there was something special about it, since he could slay the beast with a single attack. Bertrand shows off his power, easily cutting through an enormous stone, revealing that it has the power to cut through anything. Yuki wonders where he could get a sword like that, thinking he could use them to stand up to the Imperial Army, but Bertrand says it's impossible, because they are only given by the Emperor to officers above a certain rank. Yuki holds a meeting with Clan and Sil, who wonder why they are the only ones there, but Yuki says they are the most intelligent people in their religion, which they instantly agree with. They discuss the threat that the Imperial Army could invade at any time. Yuki suggests relocating the entire village, but Clan says it would be too obvious and they would get crushed. Yuki mentions they could fight back with 10,000 followers, but Sil says that would also be impossible, 
because they only have 2,000 people in the entire village, saying that the empire limits the number of people in each isolation camp. But Yuki realizes that that means there are other isolation camps, and they explain that the capital is actually surrounded by a number of separate isolation camps, which are all filled with people deemed to be abnormal. Sil suddenly starts drinking, and Roy bursts in, sensing that people are drinking. The meeting comes to an end, as they all start drinking, and Yuki ends up joining in as well. Later that night, Yuki thinks about what to do. Sil checks up on him, seeing him as her little brother. Yuki wonders if she understands how much trouble they are in, and Sil can see how hard he has been trying to protect them, telling him not to overthink things, but her words suddenly remind him of his father, who would often tell him the same thing. He thinks about how his father built their following, when they started as a small cult, but grew to tens of thousands of people. He remembers that their followers were mostly martial artists, and using their strength, they took out a gang, and took over their territory. So his father reminds him he can easily gain followers by just taking over a territory by force. The next day, Clint asks him about his plan, and Yuki says he is thinking of something that would completely destroy the culture of this world, but Clan finds it interesting, which is a surprise to Yuki. But Clan says that since they are outcasts, they are free to do whatever they want, so he encourages Yuki to carry out his plan, and Yuki says he will take their village 500 years into the future. One month later, Bertrand is in another ridiculous outfit that Al had dressed him in. Ataru suddenly appears and scans him with her skill, realizing his real identity. She wonders how he was turned into a woman, and comments on his weird outfit. She classifies him as a rebel, firing a beam at him, and Bertrand prepares to fight. But he is no match, and easily defeated, but Ataru spares him, planning to take him back to investigate how his gender changed. But she is suddenly surprised, looking at the village, seeing foreign structures, and strange beasts that she has never seen before wondering what is going on. We cut back to a month earlier, as Yuki tells his friends about his plan to get Matama 10,000 followers. Planning to use Matama's powers to offer incentives to people to gain more followers. Matama ends up making harvesting machines to help the villagers with their farming, telling the people they will be allowed to use it if they believe in Matama. The people are eager to join, but we see Matama drained of her power. She ends up recovering, thanks to all of her new followers, reaching 927. Yuki thinks things are going well, but he wonders what they should do next. Al comes in with a bucket of water, but she slips and ends up spilling it on herself, thinking she needs to go and get more water. But this gives Yuki an idea, and he ends up installing a sink at the restaurant, saying that Matama will bless all of their believers' houses. Thanks to this, they end up having a pool party to celebrate, and everyone has a good time. But Matama is exhausted, having been forced to create plumbing and connecting water to all of the followers' houses. She manages to recover, thanks to even more followers, and she starts to get excited about fighting the Empire. Yuki thinks they still don't have enough followers, so he moves to the next stage of his plan. He brings electricity into the world, allowing people to drink at the bar, even at night. It soon spreads across the whole village, and Clan is impressed at the sight, mentioning that even the Emperor wouldn't have a view like this. Bertrand asks how he would know about the Emperor, and Clan reveals he used to work in the Imperial Palace, but he chose to live in the isolation camp instead. Matama thinks he is weird for his choice, but Clan thinks she is even more interesting, asking to know more about what it means to be a god. Yuki explains there are two types of gods, one is used to explain inexplicable events, and the other is a symbol created by religions. Bertrand thinks that would make their Emperor their god, because all phenomena, disasters, and inexplicable events are explained by the assembly that works for the Emperor. The next day, Matama's power surges as she has over 2,000 followers. Yuki thinks that everyone in their village has been converted, so they need to start converting the other villages. However, Roy suddenly comes in, telling them that Bertrand was attacked and captured. Meanwhile, we see Ataru as she examines a hose, confused by how it works. She interrogates Bertrand about it, but she suddenly gets a message from Loki. She reports about the strange tools, and Loki suggests that only the Emperor or another Archon could create such things, reminding Ataru of the Archon that once betrayed them in the past. Loki tells her to just destroy the village, and Ataru starts torturing Bertrand. But Matama suddenly appears, causing her to back away. 
Ataru attacks with an energy blast, but Matama blocks it by shielding herself with some rocks. Matama summons a number of plant monsters to attack but Ataru vaporizes them. Matama summons even more and Ataru keeps destroying them, but she eventually gets caught as a bunch of monsters jump onto her and Matama follows up by binding her even further. Matama thinks the fight is over, jumping onto Yuki, but there is suddenly a huge explosion as Ataru gets free, revealing her true form. Matama knows she is running out of power, so she prepares her final attack. She sends her beasts to attack, but Ataru blows right through them. Matama thinks she is about to lose, but Yuki begs for her to win. Matama decides to borrow the power of all the other gods, because as a primordial god, she is able to use any of their powers. She attacks using their powers, and Ataru clashes with her. But after a while, the gods tell her they have to go, after seeing how few followers she had. And there is an enormous explosion as Ataru's attack lands. Ataru ends up exhausted, but Matama is defeated, and she starts crying, apologizing to Yuki for letting him down. Their friends come rushing over, but Ataru charges up an attack, preparing to wipe out the village. She throws her attack, and it completely wipes out the village. Yuki thinks he failed all of his friends, but there is suddenly a glitch, and the damage is reversed. Ataru realizes it was an illusion, and Klen appears, who Ataru recognizes as Loki. Yuki wonders what is going on, and Klen reveals that he never existed, and she is actually the Archon Loki. Ataru wonders why she got in her way, and Loki appears behind Yuki, telling them she wants their help to assassinate the Emperor. Ataru asks why she is betraying them, preparing to eradicate her, but Loki suddenly stabs her from behind, telling her she stands no chance when she is already caught in her illusion. Ataru is restrained, and Loki takes them back to the capital. They are taken to meet the Emperor, and Ataru rushes to apologize for her failure. But the Emperor is unfazed, because everything was foretold. He even knows about Yuki, attempting to revive the notion of God and religion. Yuki is shocked the Emperor knows about God, thinking he could also be from another world. But Matama becomes bored and wanders off. She suddenly destroys a pillar, thinking it was controlling Yuki, as she reveals they have been talking to a corpse this whole time. The whole palace suddenly changes, and Loki is impressed Matama could see the truth. She reveals that they were in a fake space created by the room's facilities. She tells them that the Emperor died a long time ago, and the Empire is being run by the room he created. The room is filled with machines that analyze and control everything to do with the Empire, including the end-of-life system, and do everything to keep the Empire in an unchanging state. Yuki thinks that the technology is even more advanced than his own time, wondering what kind of world they are in. Loki mentions how she has been watching for centuries, but Matama says that thousands of years ago, the world was once destroyed. But there were a few survivors that rebuilt the land so it would never meet the same fate again, and they ended up deleting their belief in God. Yuki wonders what she means, asking what world they are in, and Matama reveals they are still on Earth, but at a time far into the future. Because when he was drowning in the past, he wished to be reborn in a world where gods and religion didn't exist. Loki tells Matama she should destroy the machines, wanting to destroy the Empire. Atara thinks their purpose is to serve the Empire, but Loki is sick of serving a master that is already dead, telling Yuki it would mean the end to the end of life system, and threats of being attacked by the Imperial Army. But Yuki suddenly attacks her. Loki charges at him with her knife. But he disarms her, realizing she can't use her powers while inside the palace, which is why she needed Matama's help. Yuki demands to know the real reason she is trying to destroy the Empire, and in a flashback, we see Loki as she watches over an end-of-life ceremony. She becomes sick with how the world is, so she looks to find why the Emperor created such a world. But she finds the history of how humans used to be free, as well as the gods they believed in. She wanders about her own existence, and starts living among the people in the isolation camps as clan. Finding their lives much more free, and that's when Yuki suddenly appeared. He knew nothing about the world, but he had used strange words, and had knowledge about things normal people shouldn't know, like how to make wine, and when he started talking about God, he caught her attention. After that, she spent most of her time at the village, and Yuki was even able to summon Matama, bringing about great change to the village. One night, when Yuki thinks about establishing a doctrine, they wonder what he means, and Yuki explains that a doctrine is something that all the followers would believe, 
and Clan suggests living freely. Yuki likes his idea, and in the end, decides to go with followers be free. He thanks Clan for his suggestion, but Matama suddenly comes up to him, warning him that Yuki belongs to her, saying that Yuki has a bad habit of attracting girls. Clan wonders what she means by girl, and it turns out, Matama was able to see through her illusion, so she realizes that with Matama's power, she would be able to destroy the empire. Loki continued with an experiment, going to another isolation camp and showing them illusions to gain followers, and she managed to use her powers without the help of the machines. The Archons were built like gods, so she plans to destroy the empire and become a real god. Atara thinks she is mad, but Loki reveals she told her plan to all the other Archons, saying they would become gods, and they all agreed. Yuki agrees with destroying the empire, because he thinks Loki's wish for freedom isn't inherently bad. So he tells Matama to destroy the palace. The palace is destroyed, as an enormous tree emerges, and Loki wonders what Yuki plans to do next. He knows that the Archons will fight among themselves, and their village will eventually get dragged into it, so he plans to make Matama the true god, saying that fakes won't be able to compete with her. Back at the village, the people celebrate, now that they are no longer targets of the Empire, and Matama is praised for taking out the Empire. But Loki and Ataru are also there. Yuki wonders what Loki wants, but she says she just wants to enjoy a final night at the village with everyone. Roy is surprised that Clan was a girl, and she tricks him with an illusion, swapping positions with Ricky. Loki decides to head off, not wanting the other Archons to get ahead of her, and she leaves Ataru behind, saying she can no longer use her powers without the Empire's machines. Yuki claims he will do everything to protect the village, and Loki says she will do whatever it takes to become a god. As she leaves, she is stopped by Bertrand who sees her as a threat. But Loki uses her magic, turning Bertrand back into a man, and he is overjoyed to be back in his original form. However, Loki changes him back, mentioning how she still has powers, so he is no match for her. Bertrand wonders where she is headed, and she reveals she is going back to the capital. But Bertrand decides to follow her, wanting to stop her from doing as she wishes. The villagers finished celebrating at the bar, but Ataru is left devastated, not knowing what to do with herself. She blames Yuki for destroying the empire, but he explains he didn't have a choice. He decides to team up with her, telling her that if they defeat all the other Archons, she could absorb their powers and recreate the system and the assembly. Ataru wonders why he would help her, but Yuki says they are up against other Archons, so he could use her help, and he can't just ignore a girl that's crying. He wins her over with some ice cream, but Al watches from a distance, seeing her as competition. The next day, Yuki announces that their religion will have two gods. Matama is shocked hearing this, and her 2,000 followers get divided, with each of them having 1,000. Matama is devastated, and Ataru uses her power, blowing up a nearby rock. Yuki thinks her fighting ability will come in handy, but Matama reminds her who's boss. Ataru uses her power to defeat the giant beasts, and the group shows off their meat and alcohol to attract people from other villages. They even bring them back to the village, showing off their technological advancements, and Yuki offers to share everything with them, as long as their village accepts Matama as their god. And after doing this, Matama is up to almost 3,000 followers, and we learn they have converted three villages. But Matama gets jealous when she sees Ataru has more followers than her. But she says it's because she is the one defeating the strange beasts. Syl brings up some information she found about a woman named Dakini, who is claiming to be god in another village, and she already has 10,000 followers. Yuki thinks it must be an Archon, asking Ataru about her, but she says she only really had contact with Loki, although she knows that Dakini's power is related to love. Matama wants to crush her, but Yuki has another idea, saying the best way to take over a religion is to hijack it from the inside. They go over to Dakini's area, and Yuki thinks it looks like a love hotel. They ask to join the religion, and a girl named Rish appears, introducing herself as one of the branch leaders. She guides them through their facility, and as the other followers see Rish, they think she is the number one lover, and that she wears her glasses to contain her power. They reach Dakini's chamber, but Rish tells them they can only meet her as a male and female pair. Matama worries if Yuki will be okay without her, but he says it should be fine. Al thinks their infiltration is going well, but Yuki tells her not to let her guard down. Dakini suddenly appears, 
mentioning how she has been busy getting so many followers recently. Yuki requests to join, and Takini easily agrees, mentioning that they just need to do things the way they like, and live according to their desires. She takes a picture of them both, and just leaves the room. Yuki is suddenly overwhelmed by a strange feeling, and it seems Al has also been affected. Yuki wonders how they were affected by Dakini's powers, and he is overwhelmed looking at Al, but he manages to snap out of it, and there is suddenly an explosion, as Roy comes smashing through the wall, and Matama reveals he tried to make a move on her. Roy runs off after being rejected, and Yuki wonders what they are going to do about the hole in the room. Meanwhile, Dakini tells Rish that the secret joining ritual is complete. Rish prepares to handle the rest, but Dakini warns her that she set their love to berserk mode. As Rish goes to check up on them, she sees Matama as she is repairing the wall with her powers. But Yuki grabs onto her, warning her not to tell anyone about what she saw. They think about what they should do with her, but she starts crying and reveals she has never actually been with a man. Yuki thinks it's strange, considering her position in the group, and Rish wonders why Dakini's power didn't work on them. Yuki explains he has resistance thanks to training from his father, and Matama was unaffected since she is a god. Hearing that she is a god, Rish begs for their help, actually wanting to destroy her group. Rish explains how her village was taken over by Dakini's sect, and she was unwillingly forced to become a follower. Before she joined, she used to read the forbidden books about lovemaking, so she started making crazy stuff up, and the other followers became convinced she was experienced, even making her one of the branch leaders. She tells them she just liked to read about it, but can't stand it in real life. So she wants to get free by destroying the sect. Yuki isn't sure he can trust her, but thinks she could be useful, so he agrees to help her. Matama suddenly starts to panic as she sees her follower count dropping. We see the villagers as they try to restrain one of the giant beasts. The beast breaks free, but Sil says they bought enough time, and Atara uses her powers to blast it and take it out. The villagers praise her, and she feels like her power is getting stronger. Meanwhile, Rish explains how Dakini rotates between each branch every few days, so it will be a few weeks before she comes back around to their branch. Yuki has a plan, but when he calls for Matama, she is depressed, and Al is surprised her follower count has gotten so low when she was up to around 3,000 but Yuki says it was because she left the village. No matter how much a leader is worshipped, if they leave the group, their followers' belief will waver. But he is surprised at how fast it dropped. Matama is completely demoralized, but Yuki tells her if she can help him, he will believe in her for real, and he manages to revitalize her power. Meanwhile at another branch, Dakini spreads her message, gaining even more followers, but she notes that her power doesn't seem to be increasing. She overhears some followers talking about the new items they've obtained to help their love sessions, revealing Rish has been handing them out in her study group. We see Rish as she explains the science behind the human body, telling the followers how to achieve more intense pleasure, even attracting followers from other branches, and she starts to be praised by them. Yuki knows instead of Dakini who is not always there, the people will tend to follow whoever is around, and thanks to the items summoned by Matama and his knowledge from the modern world, Rish is able to grow her own faction. Dakini suddenly returns to their branch early, and she confronts Rish about stealing her followers, but Rish claims she was just helping them to better understand her teachings. The followers defend Rish, saying she has done nothing wrong, but Dakini realizes why her powers haven't been growing. She summons her guards to surround them, realizing Yuki as the one who has been influencing Rish. Roy has become one of her guards, and he suddenly punches Yuki, revealing that he was converted by Dakini. Dakini holds a trial, where she has the four of them restrained. She interrogates Rish about her special study group. Rish suddenly cries, as she apologizes for her actions, saying she thought she was being helpful, and she begs to be punished. The other followers are moved by her devotion, and they think she has done nothing wrong, begging Dakini to show mercy. But this was all a part of Yuki's plan. In a flashback, we see that Yuki predicted how Dakini would react, so he coached Rish on how to act, even giving her a script of what to say. Rish continues her performance, as she asks for mercy for the followers of her group, and thanks Dakini for taking her in. Everyone is moved to tears, and Dakini is put in a tough position so she has no choice and is forced to call off the trial. 
Dakini thinks about losing Rish, but decides she doesn't need her as she summons her guards. The group gets thrown into a cell, and Yuki tries to think of a way to escape. He looks over a Matama, but she is completely out of juice, and at that moment, Dakini's guards appear, and Rish explains they are known as purgers, and will follow any order that Dakini gives, even if it means taking a life. We see that when Dakini was created, she was excited to use her power to spread love, but the Emperor tells her her mission is actually to erase the people's desire for love. Dakini thinks this would lead to the end of humanity, since they won't have any children, but the Emperor tells her that people will be created artificially instead, and that way they will be able to control the number of humans. After that, Dakini would use her power on the people, taking away their desire for love, and she continued to do this every day for thousands of years. Eventually, she noticed that humans started to be born without the desire for love, and she ended up losing her reason to exist. As a form of rebellion, she spread books about making love, but they eventually became banned. As even more time passed, she met a strange girl named Taka, who would enjoy reading the forbidden books. She was oddly born with the capacity to feel love, and Takini ended up becoming friends with her, because she was different from all the other lifeless people in the city. But she was eventually marked as an anomaly, and sent to one of the isolation camps. But a few years later, Taka ended up being killed by the other villagers at the camp because she had a child with someone, but since no one was able to have children naturally anymore, she was seen as a monstrosity, and at that moment, Dakini decides she will return humans back to their original state. Meanwhile, we see the purgers as they break into the group's cell, but there is suddenly a blast of energy as Ataru makes her entrance, along with Sil. Mitama is devastated to see she has over 6,000 followers, and she wonders what's going on. Ataru fights off the purgers, and Yuki tells the group to escape, but Rish is grabbed by one of the men, dropping her books. She reaches out for her book, because it's special to her, and Al protects her from the purger. The group gets away, and Matama wonders how Ataru is so strong. Yuki explains that this was all a part of his plan. The first stage was to infiltrate Dakini's group, and dilute her power by creating a division, and the next stage was having all of Matama's followers concentrated on Ataru, so they can take over Dakini's group by force. They get out of the dungeon, and Dakini is waiting for them. She is impressed at how Yuki was able to get Rish to betray her, but she suddenly notices the book in Rish's hands, recognizing it as Taka's book. Ataru suddenly blasts her way in, and Yuki sends Matama off with Rish. Ataru wants to make Dakini pay for going against the Emperor, and Dakini attempts to use her powers on her but Ataru is able to stop her. Dakini claims she doesn't know what the Empire was really like, since she was created at the later stages of the Empire. Dakini unleashes her power, taking on a new form, and she prepares to crush them, revealing she has over 14,000 followers. Meanwhile, Matama wonders where they are going, and Rish tells her that she is their only hope of winning. Dakini unleashes her attack on the group, and they all become branded by her power. They all start losing control wanting to give in to their desires, but Matama's vines suddenly appear, restraining the girls, and Matama makes her return. Rish announces that her faction is splitting off from Dakini, and they've decided to follow Matama instead. We see Dakini's followers being transferred over to Matama, but Dakini says she doesn't care, because it's only a small number, and she still has more than enough power to crush them, but she suddenly loses her powers. Dakini wonders what's going on, and Matama says she once knew a god named Dakini, so she realized that Archons are just fakes who are borrowing their powers from the real gods. She claims Dakini was a lower-ranked god, so they instantly submitted to her after she talked to them, but we see that in reality, Matama begged the god Dakini for her help, slamming her head into the ground, and the god ended up taking pity on her, so they agreed to take away Dakini's power. Matama laughs at her, and Dakini knows she can't fight, but Roy suddenly grabs onto her, deciding to switch sides so that Matama will fall for him. Matama is not impressed, and it turns out that when they were in their prison cell, Yuki gave him a note, saying girls will fall for him if he helps them when they are in danger, so he thinks it will also work on Matama. While Dakini is stuck, Atara takes the chance and she finishes her off. Dakini wonders how she lost when she had more followers, but Yuki says it was because she was fighting alone. Rish approaches her, revealing she is the daughter of Taka, and Dakini remembers how Taka would tell her how she wanted a baby, so that they could also become friends with her. Dakini is captured, 
and Yuki demands that she tell all her followers to worship Matama instead. But Dakini refuses to do this, so Yuki threatens to kill her. However, Dakini knows that if she dies, her followers will all be scattered, and it would be hard for them to absorb, so she thinks she still has a chance. Rish visits her in the cell, and asks to learn more about her relationship with her mother. Dakini says they were best friends, and Rish thinks her actions were for the sake of her mother, so she wants to help her. Dakini agrees to hand over her followers, and they are all consolidated under Rish's faction. Since Rish worships Matama as her god, all the followers are able to be absorbed by Matama. Matama acts smug towards Ataru, since she now has over 10,000 followers. One of the strange beasts appear before them, and Matama prepares to show off her new power, but Ataru easily takes it out, revealing she also has over 10,000 followers. Matama thinks she is taking her followers again, but there are suddenly more beasts that appear. Ataru blows them away, but there are just too many, and they get overwhelmed. However, Matama is able to protect the group with her vines. She brags to Ataru, but Yuki becomes worried, realizing the beasts are headed to their village. The village is completely destroyed when they return, but the villagers were able to find a place to hide. Al finds the remains of their bar, but Sil tells her the important thing is they are safe. Yuki asks Matama to restore the village with her power, but she refuses, not wanting to lose her powers again. But Ataru asks for her help, and all the villagers beg, so she becomes convinced, and she uses her powers to restore the village. From a distance, we see a woman who can tell there is something different about Matama's power, but she plans to destroy the village again. She's about to send her beasts to attack, but she suddenly gets hit, and the beasts surround her. Meanwhile, everyone in the village celebrates, and Matama is once again exhausted. Ricky suddenly bursts in, telling them the strange beasts are back, and we see Roy carrying the strange woman, as he runs from the beast. Ataru takes it out, and Yuki arrives with Matama. Roy worries for the woman, but she suddenly wakes up and beats him up. She introduces herself as the Archon Gaia, and reveals she has the power to control the strange beasts. Yuki trips her, preparing to take her out, because he thinks her power is too dangerous. Gaia claims it was just an accident that the village was destroyed, and they go back to the bar, where she reveals she only has two followers, so she doesn't have enough followers to control the beasts, and she was even attacked herself. Yuki wonders what she is after, and she claims she wants to work together to defeat Loki. She thinks that since Loki was the one who started everything, she must have an advantage. The group heads to the capital, and they find there is now a huge wall around the area. Matama thinks about smashing it down, but Gaia shows off her power to create the strange beasts. She is only able to summon a small bird, but as it flies over the wall, it instantly gets blown away. A black knight suddenly jumps over the wall and lands in front of them, but it just turns out to be Bertrand. He claims that the Bertrand they once knew is no more, but he trips over, revealing his face, and he just wants them to end him. Loki suddenly appears, telling them they have no chance against her, and revealing that she has over a million followers. However, Yuki laughs at his number, saying they have seen enough, but he warns Loki that if she attacks them, she is the one who will be destroyed. The group leaves, but it turns out Yuki was just bluffing. They ask Bertrand about the situation in the capital, and he explains that after the system was destroyed, order in the capital was lost, but after Loki got inside the palace, things started to go back to how things were. Yuki thinks Loki must have used her powers to pretend to be the emperor, and all of the people in the capital became her followers. Al wonders what they can do against her, but Yuki claims that all her followers belong to the emperor, so he has a plan of attack. He plans to become a producer, but the others wonder what that even means. Matama prepares to become an idol, but Yuki knows she has no charisma, so he decides not to use her. There seems to be no concept of music in this world, so Yuki teaches them, and he introduces it into their daily lives. The girls form a band, and they throw a concert for the people. Matama complains about not being included, but she suddenly feels a surge in power. She finds her followers haven't increased, but Yuki mentions when Alan Sil first became her followers, she gained a disproportionately large amount of power because of the way they were converted. So Yuki thinks that her power isn't purely based on the number of followers, but also by how much they trust and believe in her. He thinks their religion is weak because it's based on providing benefits to the followers, but he thinks music is able to boost the sense of unity among the followers and make up for their weakness. 
Matama gets excited to fight Loki, but Yuki stops her, saying there is someone else they need to deal with first. We see Bertrand as he follows Gaia around. She stops at one of the neighboring villages, and she approaches some kids. She pretends to be injured in front of them, thanking them for saving her, and she invites them to come to her house. But the children know better than to follow strangers. We see one of the strange beasts as it attacks a young girl, but Gaia arrives to stop it. However, the girl runs away terrified, and it turns out the beast is working with her. Bertrand is confused seeing this, and he ends up following Gaia to a house in the forest. There are a bunch of children that call her mother, and Bertrand reports back to Yuki, who realizes that Gaia's religion is formed around her family that she's created. He knows that although it's small, the bonds between them are strong. He thinks about a way to crush them, and he ends up making a call to Dakini. She reveals she has been hooked on his music recently, so she thinks he isn't so bad. Yuki asks her to use her powers to make the children love her, but Dakini doesn't like that plan. Yuki says he wants to save the children, revealing how he was in a similar situation in his own world, and never got to have a normal childhood. He doesn't want the children to be exploited by Gaia, and Dakini ends up agreeing to help. We see her approaching the children, wanting to play with them, while Yuki and Matama keep Gaia busy practicing her drums. After a few days, the older children, Kai and Cyan, have noticed a change in their other siblings, and they catch them playing with Dakini. Dakini refuses to use her powers, wanting to save the children in her own way, and the older children wonder what's going on. Dakini claims they were just playing, but Kai can tell something is up, and they are somehow able to summon the strange beasts. Dakini runs away with the other children, and she knows she's too weak to fight. Kai and Cyan chase after her, and in a flashback, we learn more about the Empire's system. Everyone is born artificially, and at a certain age, children are assigned to a couple. We see Cyan as she is assigned, and even though there was nothing special about her parents, they always took care of her, and she felt loved by them. But one day, her father is called for his end of life, but Cyan doesn't want her father to be taken. The guards see this as rebelling against the end of life system, and her father says she should be sent to the isolation camp, because she acts differently from the other kids. She feels betrayed by her family, and she meets Kai along the way. Their carriage gets attacked by the strange beasts, but they end up getting saved by Gaia, and she convinces them they can start over as a family with her. Cyan refuses to lose her family again, as they chase after Dakini, but they find that their beasts have been taken out, thanks to Ataru. Yuki thinks about reforming the two children, but the ground suddenly shakes, and Gaia makes her appearance. Yuki warns her to know her place, but Gaia suddenly summons an enormous beast. Kai and Cyan rush over to her, and she is happy they didn't give in. However, she says they are no longer needed, and the two children sink into the ground. The creature is named Typhoon, and it's revealed to have power that's superior to even the Archons. The monster chases after them, and Ataru tries to blast it with her power, but the monster doesn't take any damage. The monster attacks with an energy blast, but Matama manages to block it. Yuki tries to get Matama to bell, to take away Gaia's power, but Matama explains that the original god doesn't understand words, so that method isn't going to work. The monster charges at them, but Syl and Al arrive just in time, and the group gets away. The monster tries to chase them, but thanks to Al's driving, they manage to escape. Ataru wonders about the creature, and one of the children named Yushi mentions it's Gaia's strongest monster, explaining that it doesn't require any power, but it just takes a long time to create. Yuki wonders how he knows so much about the monster, and Yushi reveals he read it in a book that Gaia gave him from the past civilization. Yuki is surprised he can read and understand a book from the old civilization, so he asks the boy for a favor, but the monster suddenly appears from under them. They try to get away, but Yuki falls out of the truck. He gets stabbed through his chest, and Matama rushes after him, but they both end up being eaten by the monster. The monster leaves, and the others return to the village, but they can't believe that Yuki and Matama are gone. However, Yuki wakes up and finds himself in a strange room. Gaia explains they are inside her monster, and she reveals that he can't die. She tells him she tried to kill him over 300 times, but Matama keeps bringing him back to life, even though she has no power left. Meanwhile at the village, Al refuses to give up, thinking Matama is a god, so she can't die so easily. The pendant that Yuki gave her starts to glow, and a doll of Matama suddenly appears. It writes a message to them, but they don't understand the language. 
However, Yushi is able to read it, telling them that everyone is still alive, and they are trapped inside the monster which is heading to the capital. Yuki wonders if Gaia can really defeat Loki, but she thinks it will be easy with her monster. She thinks his village are all victims that have been conned by him, and Yuki thinks about all the things he has done. But he suddenly hears Al's voice, calling him their precious friend, and we see them all calling out to him, saying they have been saved by him time and time again, so this time, it's their turn to be the ones who save him. Gaia wonders what they are trying to do, and the group starts to throw a concert. As the villagers get hyped, Atara's powers get stronger, and she goes to confront Gaia's monster. She is able to destroy two of its heads, and Dakini uses her power to help out, causing the monster to attack itself. It seems they might be able to take out the monster, but Yushi thinks it's impossible, as the monster regenerates and attacks with its energy blasts. Things are looking bad outside, and Yushi thinks about how Yuki told him to take charge if something happened to him. He tells them all to move to phase 2 of their plan, and Ataru seems to get embarrassed, but the girls tell her she is their only hope. She takes the stage by herself, and she cries as she thanks all her followers for believing in her. But she tells them it's time she moved on from being a god, and she tells them to redirect their devotion to Matama instead. Matama notices her followers increasing, and she is easily able to get free. She unleashes her powers, summoning an enormous vine monster to fight Gaia's beast. Matama finds an opening to stab Gaia, and her beast is destroyed, causing a huge explosion, but Matama protects Yuki, and they manage to get out alive. Their friends come rushing over, and they are glad he is okay. Gaia is approached by her children, and she tells them to finish her off. Kai approaches her, but Cyan stops him. Gaia thinks about how she was used her entire life, wanting it all to end, but Cyan wonders why she tried to make a family. She thinks it was because she never had a real family herself, and Cyan remembers the times they shared, wanting to start over, and saying that they can be a real family this time. Everyone celebrates, and Gaia is allowed to stick around. Yuki warns her to behave, saying Kai will be watching her for him. Gaia thinks she can win him back, but it seems Kai has promised to work for Yuki. We see that the two of them had a meeting, where Kai tells him he can't be controlled by Dakini or Gaia, but Yuki figures out it's because he is in love with Cyan, so he tells him to keep an eye on Gaia for Cyan's sake, to make sure Gaia doesn't take advantage of her again. Matama claims Gaia is now our underling, but Gaia doesn't mind this and she starts licking her. Yuki notices that Matama has 30,000 followers, but he thinks that that's more than what Ataru could have given her. Loki suddenly appears, congratulating him on defeating Gaia. Yuki wonders if she had something to do with Matama's followers, and Loki admits she gave Matama some power, so that Gaia's monster could be defeated. Yuki tells her not to underestimate them, but Loki looks forward to their visit to the capital. Yuki finds a quiet place, and he thinks about all the things that have happened, all the things they have been through, and all the friends that he's made. He swears he will do everything he can to protect the village, but he suddenly gets splashed by wine, and his friends tell him he can't sneak away from the party. He gets dragged back in, while Matama pesters him to become her follower, but he is glad that he ended up in this world. But that's where this video ends. I hope you enjoyed the video. Remember to like and subscribe to the channel. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.